high school reunion. Thank you. Raise your hands if you've ever been to high school. Thank you. Recently, I went to a high school reunion. Now, I will not tell you which reunion it was because I've been told that it's actually illegal to do that much math after lunch. Well, anyway, I ran into a friend of mine. Her name was Doris. Doris DeShazo. And Doris was the number one academic in our high school. She finished number one. Uh, number two, she was the uh, captain of the cheerleaders. So she was extremely popular, very attractive woman. And we're catching up. And the one thing you need to know about Doris is that she was also an extremely nice person, a very nice person. So we're catching up, and, uh, and all of a sudden it comes up in the conversation that no one asked Doris to the senior prom. I could not believe it. I was stunned. I was in shock. And later on that evening, I ran into some of my fellow teammates. Now, I had, I had been on the track team, and I had been on the baseball team. And I told these guys, I said, you guys, you're not going to believe this. No one asked Doris to the prom. And they had the same exact reaction as I did. They could not, they could not believe it. And many of them said at the time that they thought, well, someone else had asked her. Well, we're at the bar. And as, you know, as time wore on and we got liquored up, the truth finally came out. And the truth was this. Each and every guy was afraid to ask her. Each and every guy said to themselves, well, she'll probably say no. So they didn't have the courage to ask her. So they said no before she said no. They turned themselves down before Doris ever had an opportunity. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said no? Yeah, uh, <laughs> he said that liquor was involved. <laughs> but have you ever said no before they said no? Maybe there was a job that you wanted. Maybe there was a promotion. Maybe there was a raise that you wanted. Maybe there was someone you wanted to go out with. Maybe there was you wanted to audition for a play. Maybe there was something that you really, really wanted, and you said no before they said no. John Maxwell, who's a leadership guru, said the following. He says, the limitations that we, that we face aren't placed on us by others. We place them on ourselves. There's a friend of mine. Her name is Patricia Fripp. She is the first female president of the National Speakers Association. She's also in the Speaking Hall of Fame. She said the following. She says, the answer is no if you don't ask. Now, by the way, I too am also guilty of this. But fortunately for me, I had a coach. And my coach was my terribly handsome cousin, Ricky. He had a nickname, and his nickname was Pretty Ricky. <laughs> now, I realize that some of you, there's a rap star today. He goes by the same handle as Pretty Ricky. It's not the same guy. Well, let me just explain to you how Pretty Ricky was. We used to go to parties. Do you, do you remember going to trick-or-treating on Halloween? And then you would come home, and you would empty out your bag, right? And then you would sort out the good candy from the bad candy. Remember this? Well, Ricky would do the same thing with women's telephone numbers. <laughs> I mean, every single weekend, every single weekend, he would come home with no less than a dozen phone numbers, unsolicited. Women just walk up to him. And then he would actually take these phone numbers. And then he would just, like, let it rain, let it fall. <laughs> and then he would sort the good candy from the bad candy. And there's a couple times we have some arguments that say, hey, wait a minute, that is not bad candy. <laughs> That's good and plenty. Some of the younger people, you have to Google that last joke. But I remember one day, there was a, there was a time when he, it was senior, uh, senior prom, and he said to me, he said, Eddie, you better ask Lolita out, or otherwise someone else will. And back in those days, I had this crush on this girl by the name of Lolita Barnes. 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 <laughs> I need a minute. <laughs> Where, where was I? I'm sorry. Um, and by the way, don't you laugh at me because each and every one of you has a person like that in your lives. Am I right? I mean, the moment you mention their names, you just stop, drop, and roll. You know what I'm talking about? Well, anyway, and this particular day, we're at the locker, and he says, 
Eddie, you had better ask her out the, to the prom, because otherwise someone else is going to do that. And I said, Ricky, she just mean other than my, you know, my pride and my ego, but uh, yes, technically, you're right. He says, you've got nothing to lose by asking her. And if you do ask her, everything changes. So you've got nothing to lose by asking her, and you've got everything to gain. And he said the following to me. He says, don't you say no before they say no. Always ask. Now raise, the, raise your hands when the day began that you thought you would be gaining wisdom from a guy by the name of Pretty Ricky. <laughs> and to this day, that's the only piece of advice I've ever taken. And that, actually, that piece of advice has helped me throughout my sales career. Don't you say no before they say no. Make sense? Is this good stuff? Please turn to one of your neighbors and tell them, I told you this guy was good. <laughs> Here's what I can do. I'd like you to, to talk with one or two of your neighbors the following. And I'd like you to discuss um, what are some elements, what are, let's see, discuss with neighbor two, what are some elements of this story that, number one, made it memorable, and number two, how could you use this specific story in a selling situation? So is everyone with me? So discuss, number one, what are the elements that made it memorable for you? And number two, how could you use this story in a selling situation? You've got 60 seconds. Talk among yourselves. Go. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Internet, 20 bucks. <laughs> anyway, so um, what are some elements of this story that made it memorable? Anyone? It's relatable. It's relatable. And how could you relate to it? We, we've all went to high school, and we all had to deal with the prom. Oh, we all went to high school, <laughs> we all had to deal with the prom one way or the other, right? Okay. Did I bring back some memories? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. What else? I asked questions. Give me examples. Okay, I asked something called you focus questions. In your presentations, this is what I want you to do, is I want you to ask you fo focus questions. Ask your customer, your client, your audience. Can you relate to this? Ask them a question that directly relates to them, that connects it to them. That is by design. I have multiple you focus questions in this particular, this little story. Okay. What else? Other elements that made it memorable, yes? Okay. By, by the way, how many of you saw Pretty Ricky? <laughs> but here's something else with regard to storytelling. Don't do a lot of details. Typically, people make mistakes in the following when they're, when they're telling stories in two areas. Number one, the place and the people. They spend way too much time talking about those two areas. Only thing I described was my terribly handsome cousin, Pretty Ricky. That's all I told you. Did each, uh, each of you see your own version of my cousin? The place I told you, high school. That's all I had to say. So we're already done with the setting. We're already done with the people. Are you with me? And I also, we also had another character. Who was that? Lolita Barnes. Oh, Lord. You, you cannot say that fast. <laughs> I mean, you, you just kept rushing. <laughs> my program, my rules. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, so anyway, with regard to characters, okay. Make it as simple as possible. What else? Other elements that made it memorable for you? Okay. Yes, sir. We all saw ourselves in story. You saw yourselves in a story. Whenever possible, transport your customers into the scene. Whenever possible, transport. Whenever you're telling a story, make sure it's not I, 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 I. Make sure it's we, something that your customer can relate to, and literally transport them into the scene. To the degree that their transport into your scene, it dramatically imp imp improves your ability to close the business. Are you with me? How would you use this particular story in a selling situation? Anyone? What circumstances? 
Yes. Icebreaker. Okay. Um, thank you. What else? Anybody else? Exactly. And this particular sales training. I've actually used this story in sales training. What What is the point that I make to them? Always ask and don't you say no before the customer says no. So I could have started off, well, you know, teaching the sales team, all right, well, you know, you're always supposed to ask. That's one approach. Anyone ever attend a sales training like that where they tell you this is what you're supposed to do? Yeah. But I don't want to do it that way. I wanted to tell you a story that made the same point. Is everyone with me? Now, which way is more memorable? How many of you will be discussing Pretty Ricky later on this evening? <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to... Anyway, so we'll just stop right here and we'll just move on. So thank, thank you for participating. All right, so let's move on. Did this story make you think? Could you? Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, let's try this again. Did this story make you think? Yes. Um, could you relate to it? Yes. Uh, did it make you laugh? Yes. Okay, and were there some important messages or lessons here? Yes? yes. Thank you. All right, so anyway, by the way, that technique, for those of you who are presenting, that's called demand a response. If you don't like the response you get, you demand a response. Make sense? Yeah. All right. That's, uh, please turn to your neighbors and tell them that Ed is providing us with bonus material. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone please stand. Everyone please stand. Please point your fingers at Ed. And I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, so what? So what? Who cares? Who cares? Give me hand motions. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? It's all about me. It's all about me. Please point to your neighbor and say, neighbor? Neighbor. So what? So what? Who cares? Who cares? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? It's all about me. It's all about me. You may be seated. <laughs> this program's gonna be a little different, isn't it? <laughs> This is what people are thinking every time you make a presentation. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So what? Who cares what's in it for me? It's all about me. And guess what? They're absolutely right. You have to design your presentation so it's all about them. Nobody cares about your company. Nobody cares about your philosophies. No one cares about your, your strategies, etc. The only thing I care about is you helping me solve my problem. That is the only thing I care about. Make sense? So what? Who cares what's in it for me? So let's talk about what's in it for you. I'm going to share with you several different things. Number one, to improve your ability to persuade others using stories. That's what this whole program is about. Number two is to breathe life into your business presentations so that they're memorable. Number three is to share five of my speaking secrets. Number six is to improve your speaking confidence. There is a, 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 one of my favorite books is called The Book of Lists. And they list unusual things. For example, your favorite celebrity who's been arrested. For example, Charlie Sheen has an entire chapter. Um, <laughs> but they also have the top 10 fears. What do you suppose is fear number one? Public speaking. One year, the number two fear was being burned alive. <laughs> Let's think about this for a moment, shall we? Somewhere in the world tomorrow, someone has to give a presentation. And over here, we have their laptop, we have their notes, their cards, etc. And over here, we have gasoline and matches. <laughs> I submit to you that the number one fear is not public speaking. The number one fear is public embarrassment. No one wants to be embarrassed. I guarantee you this. If you try some of the strategies I'm going to share with you today, that'll never, ever happen to you. All right, let's move on. I'm gonna, if there's time, I will show you about the eight or nine different strategies on how to open and close every single presentation. All right, and we're gonna have some fun. So how's that agenda sound? Great. Okay, good, let's move on. All right, because uh, this time is running short. All right, so here's a secret number one. Add stories and examples to your presentations. Please place your hands up like this. Put your, put your pens down. Hold your hands like this and repeat after me. I want you to say, stories are sticky. Stories are sticky. Tell your neighbors, stories are sticky. Stories are sticky. Tell the people in back of you that stories are sticky. Stories are sticky. Tell the people in front of you that stories are sticky. Stories are, sticky. Stories are what? Sticky. sticky. So that's the reason why you want, you want to add stories to your presentations because they're sticky. How many of you remember Pretty Ricky? Yes? All right. So that's not, lesson number one. Lesson number two, by the way, there is a handout. And follow along on page number three. 
The purpose of a sales presentation is to enable the, a decision. It's not to inform, it's not to educate, it's not to entertain. It's for people to make a decision. That is the purpose of a sales presentation. Okay. By the way, great book for those of you who, for those of you who like um, books on selling. This is probably the best book I've read in the last year. It's called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. One of the best sales books I've read in the past like four or five years. In terms of presentations, another book, it wasn't designed this way, but it's called Made This Thick by Chip and Dan Heath, the Heath brothers. And why some ideas stick and others don't. And it actually has duct tape on the cover. It is a, it is a brilliant book for those of you who want to get better in this area. So those are a couple of resources. All right, let's move on. Now you're going to apply my, 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 my recipe, my formula. This is called what I call the Spark Story Selling Formula. And it stands for the following. Um, it stands for, S stands for situation, P stands for problem, or persuasion that's necessary, A stands for action, R stands for results, and N stands for know, know now. What do you know now? Um, I'll, I'll walk you through this in a moment. Let me give you an example of what we're trying to do. You're going to create a story right now. In the next, how much time do I have left? Half an hour. I got half, in the next 10 minutes, you're going to create, <laughs> you're going to create a brand new story and you're going to use it, hopefully, in your sales presentations. Okay? Um, let me give you an illustration. I've been in the speaking business for approximately 12 years. And the difference between the people who are here and the people who make it to the next level are authors. Typically, the authors are the ones who can command handsome salaries. And that's all. I'll just leave it at that. And I have been in, I, people keep asking me, how come you have a written book? How, how come you have a written book? How come you haven't written a book? Well, I have a hang up about writing. And this actually started back in third grade. My dad was in the military, and we used to transfer. I mean, God, we, I can't tell you the number of schools I went to before I was even in the fourth grade. And it seems like every eight or nine months. Well, when you transfer a lot, some of your academics suffer. In my particular case, grammar and English suffer. And I remember transferring to O'Keefe Elementary School in Chicago, Illinois. It was my second day. On the first day, they gave me a battery of tests, and they told me to write an essay. And Mrs. Taylor came out, and she said, this is terrible you'll probably have to repeat the third grade. Now, I would love to tell you that took place, that conversation took place in the privacy of a parent-teacher meeting. It took place in front of the entire third grade. I was a new kid in the block. And I would love to tell you that it stopped there, but it didn't. By the time recess rolled around, not only were my classmates making fun of me, but other kids were making fun of me as well. So needless to say, I had a hang up about writing for many, many years. Anyway, but I had a couple people who came to the rescue had a couple of heroes and a villain. The hero was a good friend of mine. His name is Darren LaCroix. This is one of my, one of my best friends in the world. He's actually speaking uh, here in the Boston suburbs at another event this weekend. We were able to hang out last night. We're going to hang out again uh, tonight. But he said, Ed, he says, uh, can you, he says, can you write a couple of paragraphs? Can, you, know, you write emails all the time. He says, a blog is nothing more than an email sharing what you've learned. You do this for a living. Can you write two paragraph email about what you've learned? And that was an aha for me. It was an epiphany. I've been writing my entire life. The answer is, of course I can. The other hero was a lady by the name of Carrie Perrin Smith. She's actually an editor. She's actually a book editor. And she said to me, she says, Ed, separate your ideas from your grammar. Now, a lot of you are going, duh. But for me, huge. That was a, as simple as that sentence was. It was a huge thing. She says, your grammar's a little weak. She says, but you know, here's the thing. We can actually hire people for your grammar. She says, there's people all over the world you know, who can actually help you with your grammar, but we cannot come up with good ideas. And she says, you have excellent ideas. So she was the first person to help me separate one idea from another, I mean, the grammar from the ideas. Make sense? Then came the villain. One day, I'm channel surfing on TV. I mean, and um, anyway, I stop, and there's this interview going on. And it's from this very attractive hostess and this African-American gentleman who's wearing a suit, but he's got these really wild and crazy sunglasses on. I'm thinking, OK, what's this about? Well, as it turns out, he's an author. And he has written a book. And the book is entitled Pimpology. How to be a pimp. And I'm going to myself, oh my gosh, a pimp has got a book. <laughs> I mean, who knew they could write? 
I mean, I, I, the only thing I thought they could do with their hands was to slap an employee. <laughs> and I'm thinking, about, and not only is, not only does he have a book, he is marketing, he's selling. <laughs> On the, the TV program, there is a trailer. There's a website, www, be a pimp now. <laughs> There's an 800 number. Operators are waiting, and you can order this on Amazon.com. How many of you know that real life is better than fiction? You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. What are some possible lessons or messages that we can learn from this story? Anybody? Anybody can write a book. What else? Yes? You can come, you can overcome almost anything. What else? Yes? There are different ways of thinking about this. You can think outside the box, there are different solutions. There are different solutions, there's different ways of thinking outside of the box. Anybody else? Yes? People are experts in all sorts of different things. <laughs> <laughs> we have all different types of experts. <laughs> yes? A good story is a good story. A good story is a good story, yes. Don't say no until someone else says no. Okay? So what I'm, here's the point I'm trying to make. Your story does not have to be something significant. You don't have to have climbed Everest or anything like that. You can take something that's a slice of life and turn it into an analogy, a metaphor, or a story and link it to your product and your service. Are you with me? And here's the cool part about this. The stories that you tell, tell no one else has heard before. They're always going to be unique. They're always going to be different. You will separate yourself from the pack just by telling your own stories. Are you with me? Is this good stuff? Please tell your other neighbor, I told you he was good. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do. Please turn your workbooks to, or your handouts, uh, to pay. Let's, let's leave it there. Let's kind of make it a little bit more generic and global. Uh, so, for example, a customer to buy your product or service, you want to get a raise, or uh, convince a loved one to take some type of action. It could be a parent, a sibling, or a friend. Um, or if it's a significant, significant other, it's, it's also called begging. Um, I'm funny. You can, I give you guys permission to laugh at my jokes, okay? You, you can laugh out loud. It's okay. I'm going to let you do that, all right? Um, so think of what is your situation. So right now, just write that down right now. What is your situation where you have, you're in a situation where you've either in the past or right now have to persuade someone to do something. And just write down a few what I call trigger words. You don't have to write down complete sentences and paragraphs. What are your circumstances? What is your situation? It does not have to be perfect. What I want you to do is I want you to walk through the process. Just, give, just come up with an example so you can actually go through the process. You going through the, the process is actually more important than the actual example. Is that clear? So just come up with an example. Do not worry about it. It does not have to be perfect. OK? You got your situation? Now, what is the problem? Oh, but this is a good quote. You never begin with a masterpiece. You are messy before you are organized. This is true of any type of creativity. You're always messy before you're organized. So we're going to be messy first, and then we're going to organize it. So what's your, your current situation where you're trying to persuade someone to do something? Number two, what's the problem that needs to be solved? What is the problem that needs to be solved? What problem are you solving? Now, if we want your story to be remarkable. The word is remarkable. What's the word? Remarkable. So our goal is? Remarkable. Okay, let's try this again. Our goal is? Remarkable. We don't want to be criminal. We don't want to be? Boring. boring. All right, so you got two minutes. Talk among yourselves. Go. It's a very nice tie. Where did you get it from? Is that like a Halloween costume tie? This is actually one of my oldest ties. Two out of 100 people. Thank you. I appreciate this. The, clearly, this was very successful. <laughs> Seriously, yes. Three? Okay. All right. I'm not going to ask you to share because there's not enough time. Normally, we would share, though. 
in front of the group. So you guys are lucky, all right? I mean, what was your experience doing this? Let, let me ask you that question. Anybody? And let's hear from some people we haven't heard from. Yes. Oh, you were Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I hadn't thought of that solution. So that was Boy, thank you. Okay. Yes. I, I saw a hand over here. Okay. I'm like an auctioneer. Yes. I would say it was really fun creating the story. Often when I'm going to create a presentation, I don't think of that as fun work. Uh huh. But this is actually fun to think about an experience and how to frame it and how to share it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Focus on very key elements, the four key elements, and don't vary from them. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, again, my purpose here was to give you like a, a super skinny story. You can flush them out, you know, and, and make them better. But again, I just wanted to give you like a, a, a super skinny uh, a skeleton where you can start and you can build from there. Okay, a couple more comments. Yes? Not doing an exhibition, how to ask questions audience Uh huh. Ah, okay, so your teammates were helpful in terms of how to ask uh, your audience or your clients uh, different types of questions. Thank you. Yes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so you like to know how, how part, okay? I thought I saw someone else over here. All right, we'll stop right here, okay? All right, um, I'd like you to stand and get back, to, uh, get back with your teammates one more time. Please, everyone, please stand, get together with your teammates. Please give your teammates a group hug. <laughs> my job. <laughs> oh, right. I'm going to share with you how to open and close any presentation. Okay? So, um, everyone please stand. Everyone please stand. Anybody else? Frame the message. There are three elements to an opening. How many? The first is called break preoccupation. The second is called frame the message. The third is called jump into the content. Everyone go. Jump into the content. Here we go again. Jump into the content. One more time. Jump into the content. Give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm tired. You may be seated. Three elements of an opening. The first is called break preoccupation. It is your duty. It is your obligation to grab the attention of your customers, your clients, your prospects, or your audience. That is your job. It is also your job to do it creatively. Have I held your attention for the past 44 minutes? Yes? Okay. Yes. That's because I put some time and energy into it. I'm going to invite you to do the same thing. Typically what happens is in most business presentations, we run off to PowerPoint and we fill in the data. And there's nothing wrong with data. What I'm inviting you to do is fill your presentations with creativity. Break the preoccupation. How many went to Jill's session earlier today? And Jill had a, a very creative presentation in terms of how do you break through and, and uh, break preoccupation with busy executives, crazy busy people. And you have to use your creativity to break through. Same thing here. S same principle applies. So number one, break their preoccupation. Number two, frame the message. The people who were in her session and who actually got through to her where she didn't delete your email, I mean your, your voicemail message, was they were able to frame the message in one sentence or less. One sentence or less, what are you talking about? For example, this presentation right here is about breathing life into your business presentations. That's my one sentence. Can you frame your message in one sentence or less? Less than 10 words. Seven is better. Can you tell what your presentation is about on a telephone call in less than 10 words? And the answer is, for most of you, the answer is no. Okay? And then finally, just jump into, jump into the content, just get on with it. So, I'm going to share with you several different ways how to open and close uh, presentations. Hmm. Never mind. Okay. Uh, number one, I've shown uh, I've shown you one method, and that's telling the story. Because what are stories? Stories are what? Sticky. Sticky. Okay. What are stories? Sticky. You know what? We need to do a quick review. Okay. <laughs> so what are stories? Sticky. Okay. So this is your. Hey. And it makes you. Hey. This is your. Hard. And it. This is your Belly. makes you. Laugh. This is the Man. heavy hitting, and that is the message. Okay, there are three elements to an opening. How many? Three. The first is called. Three. 
The second is called? The third is called? Here's something that's really cool. None of you looked at your notes. I've just summarized my entire presentation and not one of you looked at your notes. Please tell your neighbors, who is he good? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, audience involvement. Have I shown you multiple ways to involve your audience? Yes. Now, you're not, you're not going to have a customer like doing this. I can't, you know, a CEO is not going to do that. Okay? But uh, audience, audience involvement is asking questions, having dialogue. It's simple as that. Make sure that your presentations are engaging. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. That's your goal. And if you have conversations, you will close more business. Okay? Number three, uh, you, know, you use co quotations. I love this. Some people use statistics like a drunken man uh, uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. Startling statistics. Now, it is not my intention to offend. So I, I need to preface this one. It's not my intention to offend. However, there's sometimes this technique it breaks through the preoccupation of your customers and your clients. And, you, and I want you to use this, this particular technique. I want you to consider three numbers. And uh, what I mean by a startling statistic, this is something that's interesting or unknown. And I want you to look at numbers in a different way. And I'm going to show you, and I'll explain to you why this works a little <laughs> bit later on. Okay? Uh, three numbers. Number one, 4,287, 12,998, and over 248,000. Uh, 4287, 12,998, over 248,000. Number, the first number, 4,287. That's the number of U.S. casualties in Iraq since March of 2003. That's the number of young servicemen and women who have lost their lives on the war on terror. <coughs> Second number, in excess of 12,998 drunk, uh, drunk driving related deaths annually in the United States. 39% of all fatalities, all fatal accidents in our country are due to drunk driving. 12,998 last year. In excess of 248,000, that's the number of drunk driving related injuries in our country annually. One person is injured every two minutes because of a drunk driver. Now, I do not mean to be crass, nor do I mean to undermine the difficult challenges that are faced by our young servicemen and women. But the truth of the matter is this. You have a higher probability of being killed by your drunk neighbor than you do a terrorist. Question. Did I break your preoccupation? Did I frame the message? And did I jump into the content? Now, these statistics, this information I just shared with you, was shared, originally I heard from a dentist testifying in front of the Colorado State Legis Legislature. That's my hometown. Unfortunately, his 17-year-old daughter was T-boned by a drunk driver. And he was testifying in front of the legislature. And he shared with them these startling statistics. And he was successful in terms of actually persuading them to actually change the laws in the state, state of Colorado. Folks, if you ever visit Colorado, do not drink and drive. You may not be able to leave the state. OK? <clears throat> if you rely on fact statistics and charts to make your point, you risk putting the audience to sleep. Now here's something, research, which is unknown. So in your presentations, maybe you have five points you want to make. I want you to ask that question for each one of those points. Write the question down. What is the best way for me to make this point? And the answer isn't always PowerPoint. Sometimes it's a conversation. Sometimes it's a story. Sometimes it's a demonstration. What is the best way for me to make this specific point? And if you ask that question for every one of your Every parts of your presentation, I guarantee you, number one, it's not going to be boring. And number two, it'll be creative, and you will stand out from your competition. All right, I'm going to stop right here. And uh, I'm going to end, always have an ending to your presentations as well. Just don't say, oh, that's my time. Because last words linger, and you always want to have the last word. By the way, if you could, if, for those of you who do executive briefings and presentations, don't have Q&A at the end. That's a huge mistake. Huge mistake. You want to have the last word. Have Q&A towards the, there's two ways to do Q&A, as you're going along or at the, towards the end. Have it just before your closing remarks. You want to have the closing remarks, no matter what it is. Because you can have a really good presentation, and if you reserve Q&A towards the end, and somehow in Q&A, if everything unravels, that's the final impression people are going to have.
Are you with me? So don't have Q&A at the end. Anyway, I am, I'm going to close with a poem. It's written by a lady by the name of Portia Nelson. It's entitled An Autobiography in Five Chapters. And the reason I'm going to close with this poem because it ties neatly together everything we've talked about here so far. Not only for my presentation, but for this entire conference. So I want you to think about this poem with regard to what you're going to do next after this conference is over with. Now, some of you may have heard this poem before. Please tell one of your neighbors that Ed tells it the best. <laughs> and it goes like this. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. But it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. I'm not responsible. It takes a long time for me to dig myself out of this hole, but eventually I do. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk, but this time I pretend it's not there. I still fall in. It's still not my fault. I'm still not to blame. I'm still not responsible. It still takes a long time for me to dig myself out of this hole, but eventually I do. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see the hole. I still fall in. It's a habit. <laughs> now, this is a rhetorical question. No one here has to answer. But how many of you have fallen into the same hole over and over and over again? But this time, I recognize that it is my fault. I am the blame. I am responsible. The moment I recognize that, immediately I get out of the hole. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around the hole. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. <laughs> and hopefully, with the tools, the strategies, the techniques that you have learned at this conference this year, when it comes to your sales presentations and your selling, you too can walk down another street. Thank you. God bless you all. And you're out of here. <laughs>